Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. Josephine Baker was a superstar in the 1920s, an African-American by birth who felt more at home in France than in the US, a person of virtually no formal education whose ambition and innate abilities allowed her to rise from obscurity and poverty to wealth and fame, a woman famous for her exploits with men. This, ladies and gentlemen, was Josephine Baker. How was Josephine Baker the wealthiest black woman in the world? Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. Josephine Baker, the Black Pearl and the Bronze Venus Josephine Baker was captivating audiences worldwide as an entertainer by the mid-1920s and achieved acclaim as the 20th century's first international black female sex symbol by the mid-1930s. She revelled in her seductiveness on stage and off, living a life that was the very stuff of legend and rumour. Both her friends and her public recognised the talent, ambition and sexual provocativeness but few seemed to see her life as the queer dialogue it was with the world around her. For make no mistake, Josephine Baker led one queer life. Her sexuality was an important part of it. It's the fact that nearly everything she did expressed desires and needs that deviated significantly from the prescribed social norms of her times. What's more, to live life on her own terms, she was always willing to transgress those norms at every turn. Josephine Baker was born Frieda Josephine MacDonald in St. Louis, Missouri in 1906. She was the daughter of Carrie MacDonald and vaudeville drummer Eddie Carson. Considering the strange circumstances of Baker's birth, many scholars believe that the mystery sugar daddy was actually Baker's biological father, whose identity is a mystery to this day. On paper, Baker's father was listed as Eddie Carson, though evidence suggests her biological father was actually an unknown white man. Her mother Carrie was a washerwoman and ex-Vaudeville girl. Her father ran off when Josephine was only a little girl. Before he left, he and Carrie had done some stage shows together, reputedly even bringing young Josephine on stage. And it may have been his abandoning her that gave Carrie her dislike of show business. Naturally, her mother's disdain only fueled young Josephine's interest in the stage, though it took her a while to get there. For most of her childhood, her sanctuary and refuge from life was the Booker Washington Theatre, named for the famous black civil rights pioneer. Josephine's first job was as a domestic servant, hired out to white families by her mother. There she was a cleaner and a babysitter, though one white mother warned her not to dare kiss the babies. She also performed on street corners to raise money and perhaps to escape from the grim reality of life for a poor black girl in St. Louis. She was definitely physically abused by her employers. One woman burned her hands for wasting laundry soap and was almost certainly abused by them as well. At the age of 13 she got a job working in an ice cream parlour ran by a man known in her biography only as Mr. Dad. By this stage, Josephine's mother had effectively kicked her out of the family home for her to get room and board from her employers, and a persistent rumour began that he was getting more in exchange from her than her waitressing. When word reached Carrie's ears, she was mortified by the scandal. She dragged Josephine out of the ice cream shop, and at the advice of Josephine's godmother, had her married off to a steel worker named Willie Wells. Josephine was still only 13 when she was married, something which made it illegal in Missouri at the time. The marriage didn't last. Josephine spent more than Willie made, and the two quarrelled bitterly. The last straw came when she claimed to be pregnant, but then turned out to be lying. The two split up. Josephine began working as a waitress. Some rumours also have it that she moonlighted as a cool girl and at the age of 15 she finally made it onto the stage at the Booker Theatre. Married twice, by the age of 15 she got her big break after she moved to France, proving to be a sensation when she appeared on stage at the legendary Paris cabaret Folie Bergère in 1926, 
singing and dancing dressed in a short skirt of artificial bananas, a beaded necklace, sandals and nothing else. Baker's famous upturned banana skirt was designed by the famous French artist and critic Jean Cocteau, and the garment became an absolute sensation. When European toy manufacturers began to produce popular Josephine Baker-esque dolls, they immediately knew that they had to dress them in Baker's iconic banana skirt. Baker was at the top of her game, but the hit parade wouldn't last forever. Accompanied on stage in later performances by her pet Cheetah, Baker quickly became an icon of female sexual liberty in the Jazz Age in Paris, a city which was by then Europe's cultural capital, home to Ernest Hemingway, a friend of Baker's, and Picasso, who sketched her. She was an unforgettable female ebony statue. A scream of salutation spread through the audience. Whatever happened next was unimportant. The two specific elements had been established and were unforgettable. Her magnificent dark body, a new model that to the French proved for the first time that black was beautiful, and the acute response of the white masculine public in the capital of the hedonism of all Europe. Though she lacked training, her enthusiasm and spark made up for it, and she was hired. She was a fast learner and took to the life with enthusiasm. Before long, she abandoned St. Louis for Memphis, joining Bob Russell's troupe of performers. She got the job through the influence of Clara Smith, a blues singer who Josephine had been watching on stage since she was a little girl. Josephine became Clara's protégé, avidly studying everything that made Clara a success. She also found her way into Clara's bed. Josephine was bisexual, though discreetly so throughout her life, and such relationships were a generally accepted part of life on the road for performers like them. Josephine's role in the troupe was as the last girl on a chorus line, traditionally the comic relief. The last girl was always making mistakes, in an amusing fashion, until the dancers came back on stage for the encore. There she would show her true skill. It was a grounding in physical comedy that would become a hallmark of Josephine's style. At the height of the Harlem Renaissance, Baker was a successful Broadway performer. In time she was billed as the highest paid chorus girl in vaudeville, but success didn't come overnight. When Baker first auditioned to join the all-black cast of Shuffle Along, the producers showed her the door for a cruel reason. She was too skinny and too dark but Josephine wasn't one to give up without a fight. While Josephine worked long days as a dresser, she spent her nights studying the shuffle along routines and learned them by heart. Soon enough, all her hard work paid off. When one of the original dancers left the show, Josephine saved the day and then some. When she performed, Baker would act silly and pretend not to know her moves. Later in the encore, she would wow the crowd by performing the steps perfectly. Baker's professional life was going spectacularly, but her personal life was another story. Josephine always lived life to the fullest. Once settled down in Paris, Baker rubbed elbows with the biggest names in art and caused an absolute frenzy. Almost overnight she became the toast of the town, and young men roamed the Paris streets, dreaming of her lithe body dancing the Charleston, while barely clad in bananas, boa feathers, and diamond chokers. Pablo Picasso jumped at the chance to paint her beauty, while the French writer and artist Jean Cocteau wanted her to star in films. Baker pioneered erotic dancing by performing sultry numbers clothed in just a single ostrich feather, or, when she was feeling even more risque, in the nothing. While some people see exotic dancing as improper, Baker firmly disagreed. With her blend of silly expressions and sultry dance moves, her act was all about joy and sexual freedom. Why did Josephine Baker love France so much? The answer is simple. It was nowhere near as discriminatory as the USA. When Baker and her fellow black performers boarded a train, they were shocked to see that they could sit wherever they pleased. France's more accepting society made a huge difference to Baker's career. She became the first African-American woman to take the lead role in a major movie, playing heroines in Zuzu, 
The Siren of the Tropics, and Princess Tam Tam. Meanwhile, back in Hollywood, black actresses were mostly stuck playing maids. During her time in Paris, Baker was a bona fide A-lister, from her stage shows to her starring roles on the silver screen. Josephine Baker was the name on everyone's lips. Is it any wonder that by 1927 she was said to be the wealthiest black woman in the world? But as Baker was ascending to the top of the A-list, Europe was falling into its darkest era. When Baker began her glitzy tour through Europe in 1928, she had no idea what awaited her. As she entered Vienna, Baker realised that she was deeply unwelcome. All over the city, cruel posters called her a black devil and urged the public to avoid her shows. Once so much more accepting than the United States, Josephine's beloved Europe had become just as discriminatory. Later in life, Baker remembered how it felt for the Viennese people to hate her just because of the colour of her skin. She said that as she travelled to her accommodations, she saw the streets lined with angry Venetians who screamed at her carriage. Baker recalled that their jeers immediately transported her back to a nightmarish time in her life, the race riots of her youth. Never one to back down from a bully, Baker knew that she couldn't just sit back and allow hate to reign in her beloved Europe. Baker decided that she had to take action. By day she would continue her performances, but by night she secretly became a spy for the French resistance during World War II. Baker often took advantage of the trappings of her superstar lifestyle. Baker would use her touring schedule as a cover to help her get in contact with politicians and military officials, but her most dangerous act of rebellion was yet to come. Baker bravely used her mansion to hide weapons and provide safe haven for refugees and resistance fighters. On one occasion, this nearly spelled her doom. When the Germans learned about Baker's safe house, they paid her a visit. Ever the charmer, Baker held them at bay and got out of the tricky situation, all without the Germans realising that a group of French resistance fighters were right under their noses. Baker's espionage tactics included far more covert operations. She started out by simply writing intel on her hands and arms, but her methods became more complex quickly. The large piles of sheet music that accompanied her person on tours were really secretly coded intel. She would circulate the songs to allied contacts spread across several neutral European countries. The trick was taking the sheet music and writing pertinent information on top of the music notes in invisible ink. During her days as a spy for the Derziem Bureau, Baker came up with an ingenious way to hide super-sensitive documents. She simply pinned secret photographs of Axis military installments in a place where no official would dare to look, inside her underwear. Baker always dazzled the starstruck immigration offices too much for them to really check her stuff. Josephine Baker collected colourful nicknames over her life. Throughout her long career, she was called the Bronze Venus, La Baker, Black Venus, Black Pearl, and even the Creole Goddess. Josephine Baker had a strong reputation for being on the right side of history. Baker was one of the Jazz Age's most jaw-droppingly beautiful women, but if you asked her about it, she'd demur. Baker once said, Beautiful? It's all a question of luck. I was born with good legs. As for the rest, beautiful, no. Amusing, yes. Just four days after performing in Josephine Abobino, 1975, Baker tragically suffered a cerebral hemorrhage in her hotel. When she died, the legendary performer was surrounded by rave reviews of her final iconic show, with many of her friends saying that Baker died of joy. At the time, the legendary chanteuse was just a few months shy of her 70th birthday. If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you are new here, and if you want to support my work, please visit my Patreon page. Now it is your turn. What do you think about the life and legacy of Josephine Baker, the 20th century's first international black female sex symbol?